want to thank you for joining me today again on this Tuesday Bible study. Let's begin with prayer. Heavenly Father, we are most blessed today with your presence in our lives. We pray that you would also be with us in our Bible study, that it might reflect your will for us, where we might understand a little bit better your call upon us. We ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, well, we are looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 12 to 31, and we are still in the season of Epiphany. This is our third Tuesday in this season after the Epiphany, actually. And uh, as we look at this lesson, it's a continuation of what we looked at last week. And again, Paul was talking about spiritual gifts, if you might remember. And so let's just jog our memories with that. That everybody has differing gifts. Now the problem is, is that sometimes some people think that they are better than others. This leads to a great deal of conflict, which is exactly what we see going on here in the church in Corinth. This is a conflicted church. I want you to imagine the worst circumstance you can possibly imagine in the congregation in which you have belonged, and maybe you had conflict between the pastor and this group of people, and half the church left because of this conflict, on and on and on. That's what was going on in Corinth at the time. And, and a lot of the battle lines were drawn between Jews and Greeks, so there's a lot of fighting between Jews and Greeks. The Jews thinking, hey, we were the first, you know, we were the, they're like the older brother, if you remember that parable of Jesus and the older brother and the younger brother, and the one brother who, who stays and takes care of the needs of his dad, the other who kind of goes off and takes his dad's inheritance and spends it on, and profligate living and so forth, and the older brother says, I've always been here, you know, this is kind of the way the Jews respond to it, but then you also have the poor and the rich, so you've got conflict between poor and the rich, we actually have an illustration of this here in 1 Corinthians where the rich way would bring their wealthy, they would have a potluck supper on a regular basis as a, and, and as a part of their communion meal. And Paul's like, you guys don't even understand what communion is because the rich would bring their caviar. Well, I'm kidding about the caviar, but very wealthy things that wealthy people would eat. I'm just using caviar as that's kind of usually that one of those things that high flutin people we think of as eating and so forth. And so they brought their caviar. But guess who were first, the first people in line? Oh, the rich people. They ate from the food that they brought and left nothing over for the poor because they thought they were somehow special. This was the conflict that was going on in Corinth at the time. So the rich and the poor add conflict. This has been going on for millennia, hasn't it? It's the story of this world. Always somebody wants to have an advantage over somebody else. And so Paul wants to continue. He talks about spiritual gifts, but he doesn't want people to get a big head. We have that today, don't we? We have pastors who are literally making millions of dollars off of being a pastor. I don't get it. I am outright telling you my bias right now. A pastor should never make significantly more than the average people in this congregation or her congregation. Just shouldn't. So if you've got a pastor who's making a million dollars, but the average person in your congregation is making $50,000, there is something wrong with this here in that church. Okay? If you've got a pastor, and I've actually seen this, we've got a pastor who's driving his Mercedes-Benz, while most people in the congregation can't even afford a car. He's wearing his uh, several thousand dollar Armani suits, and the people barely have a tie and a, a ragged shirt to put on for church. There is something wrong in that congregation. You know, if there isn't conflict, there should be conflict. Because there's something wrong when a pastor is making that much money compared to the people of his parish or her parish. And I think the same thing is true in our, our church at large. We honor, I don't know, uh, faith healers. Oh, they're so spectacular. You know, here's my view of it. If you're a faith healer, get a job. Use your faith healing as a blessing and just gift people who come to you because that's how God gifts to us his love. It's free. I can't understand a faith healer making money 
off of being a faith healer. It doesn't make sense to me. <sighs> there you go. This is the conflict that's going on in the church. So let's take a look at our lesson. I've already said some controversial things, haven't I? I am a pastor. I understand that I am very blessed with a congregation that at least tries to take care of me to the best of their ability so that I can serve them. But I'm not paid for my service. They give me something so that I can free myself from other employment and dedicate my time here. It's okay. That's okay. But I'm not making a killing, and I don't think any pastor should. Not for their spiritual gifts, as though we, we esteem certain spiritual gifts. Let me just uh, read this. and You know, we certainly see this type of esteem in our culture towards professional athletes. They get paid an absurd amount of money for dribbling a basketball up and down the court. How stupid is that? Doesn't make any sense to me. When the most important people in our society probably get 15 bucks an hour. Right? This is the conflict. So Paul looks at the church and says the church should not be doing the things the way the world is doing things. Okay? So he says, for just as the body is one and has many members, all members of the body, though many are one body, so it is with Christ. He's saying this should not exist in the church. You guys with the big heads who think you're somehow specialer, more specialer, than other people because you've got particular gifts, you need to rethink the way this is because we're one body. We all contribute to the same action. You know, can you imagine how silly it is? Well, he's going to go on and show you how silly it is. For in one spirit, we are all baptized into one body, Jews and Greeks. Okay, so there you go. He mentions again the one conflict, that, one of the two conflicts that we talked about between Jew and Greek. Jews thinking, hey, we've been here, our church, you're going to do what we tell you to do. Have you ever been in a church, and I, actually this has happened in our congregation, where new members join the congregation, they're so excited, and they want to serve in some way, but then somebody tries to pump the brakes and say, you haven't been here long enough, you're not welcome to an opinion here yet. Well, when is a new member no longer a new member? 30, 40 years from now? <laughs> at our church... I was at in Kentucky. I remember we actually had the new members of the church. And I went to visit with them one time, and they still were kind of the outsiders. And I said, well, how long have you been here? He said, well, only 30 years. 30 years! And you're still seen as the new members? I think there's a problem here, peoples. All right? All right, so we go on. For one spirit, all were baptized into one body. Jew and Greek, slave and free. You see another conflict there, slaves and free. And they're both in the church. That, of course, distinguishes between the impoverished and the people with money. They were all made to drink of one spirit. So in other words, God didn't withhold himself from, if you're Jew, you somehow got a special blessing compared to the Greek. Or if you were a free person and had money, you don't get a special blessing from God over the people who are, who are in bondage. No, they all drink of the same drink. We all receive the same gift from Jesus Christ, so therefore we should all treat each other the same. So look at 14. Indeed, one body does not kiss, consist of one member, but of many. If the foot were to say, because I'm not a hand, I don't belong to body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. So you can take that one of two ways. Maybe the foot is saying, hey, I'm more important than all you all. I don't need you. Well, sorry. The body needs you, and you need the body. And it goes the other way, too. Sometimes people feel or you're very self-deprecating. They think less of themselves. Oh, I'm only a foot. I'm not something splendid. He's going to get into that in a minute. Really? You're important. You are as important as the pastor of the church, as that faith healer that does those spectacular things, as that leader who can do incredible things. You are also spectacular and just as important to body. Paul's going to say that. Just listen to it in just a moment. So if the ear were to say, because I'm not an eye, 
I don't belong to the body, that would not make it any less part of the body. Where the whole body and I, where would the hearing be? Do you see how we need each other, right? That's what he's saying. If the whole body were here, where would the sense of smell be? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each of them as he chose. So here's the thing that really kills me about people who kind of pat themselves on the back for their gifts and say, I've got this special gift compared to you all. Wait a minute. Who gave you that gift? Oh, this is that Sunday school answer again. Who gave you that gift? Jesus gave you that. I don't know if I'm going to be able to do this. We'll see. That's a gift. See, there's supposed to be a bow here. Isn't that pretty? Jesus gave you the gift. It's not yours. You didn't create it. Now, you can nurture it, but you're not the one that gave it to yourself. You can't pat yourself on the back and say, Oh, look at me, how great I am. It's a gift of God. And God gave to you as God chose and saw it fit. So you can't act like you are somehow more specialer than anybody else. Paul goes on. I love this. If we're all, if all, everybody were a single member, where would the body be? Everybody's gifted in different ways, right? Everybody needs to be diff differently able. I'm going to tell you how this works in, in a church, okay? We have people, and this is the way it should work in our country too, but it doesn't. It doesn't work always this way in a church too. You have a church where you have, um, you have uh, vision people. I tend to be a person that has, I like to see the big picture and the vision say, oh, this is what we can do. Look at what we can create. Look at all these spectacular things. And then you've got the real practical people. And there's there's such a drag, aren't they? The people who are, have vision, they're such a drag because they're always saying, well, I'm not sure that's realistic. You know, usually it's the people who understand a little bit about how to organize things. It's a great vision, but you know what? I'm not sure we have all the gifts that we need to accomplish that vision. I'm not sure that's what God wants us to. So they kind of bring things down a little bit, and vision people just feel really hemmed in. But you know what? God has given the person of vision this type of person, because this type of person helps evaluate the vision and say, maybe that's not what God has given us to do. You might have this grand vision, and it's still grand, but we have to meet we have to uh, 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 put into place a vision that meets the gifts and the talents that we have. So they're really practically oriented. So like I said, a vision person feels really hemmed in by that practical person. That practical person really gets stressed out by the people who have that vision, right? They're like, oh, just stop and think for a bit. Okay, we need both. We need both. They're both important to the body of Christ. <sighs> I'm trying to stop myself from saying something political here, but I am going to because it's important. This should also understand how it affects our country. There are people uh, who think a particular way. They think a particular way and they register as Republicans. There are people who think a particular way they register as Democrats. Here's the problem. Our country needs both. Because Republicans have this very thing when it comes to caring for people. What do I need to do to stick my hand in my pocket and give to this particular task? You know, Democrats tend to think of structures. How do we create the structures? to perpetuate the care and need, and how do we catch the people in the corners and build, build this, uh, uh, this catch-all that catches the people before they fall or when they fall and so forth. So they think very differently about how do we care for the poor and how do we take care of those around us. The problem is that personal charity of reaching into your pocket doesn't help everybody. There are people who fall between the cracks. And then we've got the other problem, these structures that we built, they're so slow-moving. They can't move quick enough to help the people in our community. Wouldn't it be grand if we realized that these are actually strengths, that if we bring them together, we can do some spectacular things. The problem is, the United States of America isn't a Christian nation, never has been. 
So we don't rely upon Jesus. We create a po uh, policy of conflict to get ourselves elected into office. And this is what Paul is trying to avoid here in the church. The church, however, should not be this way. Not the church. We need to get rid of that conflict. So let's go on. Oh, did I tick you off? Oh, well. Wouldn't be the first time, would it? Okay. Um, so we go on, verse 22. On the contrary, the members of the body that seem to be the weakest are the most indispensable. And those members of the body that we think less honorable, we clothe with greater honor and with, and our less respectable members are treated with greater respect. Whereas our more respectable members do not need this. But so God has arranged the body, giving the greater honor to the most, the, the, those who seem the most inferior members, that there may be no dissension within the body, but the members may have the same care for one another. You know, he's talking about thinking in terms of, we think of the third, you know, our, our um, uh, modesty. We cover certain parts of our bodies. Uh, because, and we think of some of those parts that we cover as lesser than. Paul is saying, excuse me, no they're not. You couldn't survive with those things that we cover with modesty. They are some of the most important parts of the body. Okay? And he's saying the same thing about the church, and I would contend the same thing in this country. So, I always tell folks this story. I keep telling you, we overvalue certain gifts and abilities in this country like professional athletes. When you've got a professional athlete who's making 20, 30 million dollars a year, that's obscene. There's no, nobody, nobody in this country who's worth 30, 25, 30 million dollars a year. Nobody. I don't care uh, what your name is, LeBron James. You're not worth 25, 30, 40 million bucks. I think he's making more than that, actually. He's not worth that much money. Nobody's worth that much money. No CEO is worth $50 million a year and, and sev getting severance pays for basically running a business in the ground to get $10 million severance pay. What the heck is the deal with this? We honor certain abilities that are honestly not as important as some of the other abilities. Like if I were to go to a baseball game and I were to watch the star player of the Pirates women. Do the Pittsburgh Pirates even have a star anymore? I don't know. They get traded away once they become good. <sighs> I know that's my bitterness there coming out, right? <laughs> okay. So you've got the Pirates. They've got a star. Like I said, I have no clue who that would be because we haven't had a star in forever in Pittsburgh. Uh, McCutcheon was probably one of the last ones. And, you know, they all, they come, they go because they get traded away. We don't... Our ownership doesn't want to pay the money. All right, so we've got a star. Maybe the star's making $20 million a year, $50 million a year, whatever the case might be. So we'll say $20 million a year. I come out to the baseball stadium and watch the Pirates play, and that star, who's getting paid $20 million, bats zero for five that day, okay? Or if it's a pitcher, he gives up 15 hits and 10 runs and three innings, okay? He's the star pitcher, okay? So 15 hits, 10 runs. So here's my question. Am I gonna come back to the baseball stadium again? Yeah, because I'm a pirate fan. I'm a glutton, right? I will go to the game again. But, but, these are the people that make 20 million. All right, 20 mil per year. They stink up the joint, I'm still coming back. This guy stinks up the joint, this pitcher, still coming back. But there's a very humble person who determines truly whether I will come back to the baseball stadium. I don't know this person's name. Person might be lucky to get 15 bucks an hour, maybe. Okay, this person gets 15 per hour. Who am I talking about? Oh, that's the person who cleans the seats and cleans the toilets and the bathrooms. Because I will tell you what, if I walk into the Pirate Stadium and every time I sit down on my seat, it's sticky and there's dirt and slime and ice cream all over it. And I go into the bathroom and it is filthy every single time I go there. I will never come back to a Pirate game. So here's my question. Who's the most important person in the Pirates organization? 
Why are we paying this person 15 bucks an hour and this person 20 million? How stupid are we? This guy should be paying as much as this guy is getting paid because this person is worth more to this organization than this guy is. I know, he's got all the, the glorious talents, but I'm thinking in terms of a Christian. We as the Church of Christ should not be rewarding somebody because they have this really publicly visible thing that they do in comparison to the person who behind the scenes does all the hard work. Okay? Spectacular. We can't do this in the United States. Doesn't happen. Falls apart. Because again, we are not a Christian nation. We never have been. If Jesus Christ is not at the center of it, and if love is not the only law, it's not Christian. Love has never been the only law in the United States of America. We have all these other laws that automatically proves to you this is not a Christian nation. Jesus is not at the center. It's a secular country. That's okay in this world, by the way. I don't want to get in debate about that. Someday maybe we will. But let's go on. So God, again, closed the lesser members with greater honor and respect. If one member suffers, verse 26, everyone suffers together. One member is honored, all rejoice together. So you are the body of Christ. Individually, you're members of it. And God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, deeds of power, gifts of healing, forms of assistance, forms of leadership, very kinds of tongue. When Paul is saying first, first, second, third, he's not saying again, this is the priority, this is the most important guy. He's just creating a list. He's numbering that list not because one has priority over the other. That would just kind of betray everything that he's just said. So don't read into that. The most important people in the church are apostles. No, they're not. They're the ones that mostly people point to and say, oh, they're the ones that bring people into the church. How great are they? However, it's the person waiting on tables that creates the feeling of hospitality. Uh, let, me, let me tell you the truth. People who go out in the neighborhood are really good about evangelism. They seem spectacular, and they are great and spectacular. They have unique gifts that many people don't have. However, pastors, evangelists, they are not the most important people in the church and whether or not if somebody decides that they're going to come to a relationship with Christ. It is the average person in the pew. In fact, statistically speaking, 85 to 90 percent of people who say that they've come into a relationship with Christ do so because a lay person told them about Jesus. Not a pastor, not an evangelist. Now, the pastor and the evangelist support that work, again, of this less honored member who's doing all the hard work. Okay? We need to rethink the way we think church and caring for each other. Ah, let's go on. Great. Are all apostles, are all prophets, this is verse 29, are all teachers, do all work miracles, do all possess gifts of healing, do all speak in tongues, do all interpret, strive for the greater gifts. I will show you the more excellent way. Okay, so we're stopping right here. Please come back next week. Because remember, I've just spent this whole time trying to convince you that a pastor's gifts, or an evangelist's gifts, or a television evangelist's gifts, or, or uh, a faith healer's gifts, they're not more significant than the person who waits on tables and cleans the dishes and, and does the dishes in, in the uh, kitchen after a big dinner. Not more important. They shouldn't be honored anymore than the person who does that. It's the behind-the-scenes people that God lifts up because they're equal. An evangelist can't do his or her job without those people in their roles of support. We need each other. We're one body. We operate together. So nobody should get honor and glory more than the next. And so next week, Paul is going to show you the more excellent way why we as a country do pay $20 million athletes for a, a skill, honestly, and a gift that they don't deserve $20, $30 million for. They don't. 
and we only pay $15 for the person who really is important to the organization. Doesn't make sense. Doesn't. But it's a secular country. Okay? Jesus isn't at the center. But Paul is going to cast a vision for us next week of what happens when Jesus is at the center. And what does that look like? Until then, I'm praying that you wrestle with this for a bit. Maybe you are a lay person who's like that $15 an hour person. Maybe you're the person that does all the behind the scenes work. Maybe you fold the bulletins. Oh my goodness! How spectacular are you? I'm serious. Maybe you're the person that shovels walks. Thank God we've got all the snow. We're so grateful for you. Maybe the person who picks up the phone, I got one of these in our congregation, calls the shut-ins. Says, hey, just checking in on you. She's just shut-in herself. <laughs> She's calling people her shut-ins for crying out loud. Because God has put that on her heart. She is spectacular. Just as spectacular as anything that I do. Now, I might teach here today. That doesn't make me spectacular. I might be in front of this camera. But she's more important than I am. Because God honors those things that we do not see that sometimes we hold in lesser honor. Because these are the most important gifts of all. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I'm sure there are, hope, well, probably many at home sitting here and hearing this, and maybe they've not heard it this way before. Maybe they think lesser of themselves. I'm not a faith healer. I can't preach. I'm not good. I can't go out and do evangelism. So what? That's not how God has gifted them. But they have been gifted in a spectacular fashion to accomplish some amazing things. And so I'm just praying that you would lift up those in our body who felt beat down as though they're somehow lesser of significance. We just commend them to you this day in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, may God's blessing be upon you this week. Be filled with joy and peace. May the Lord, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit bless you and keep you now and forever. Go in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen.